my mind to Calvary where Jesus bled and died for me I see his wounds his hands his feet my Savior on that curse bound and drenched in tears they laid him down in Joseph's stone the entrance sealed by heavy stone Messiah still and all
Thank you for joining us for worship on YouTube and Facebook Live this morning. I hope that you have enjoyed some of these beautiful warm days this week and just the beautiful colors of the leaves. We'll be in Luke chapter 10 this weekend in our series called The Doctor is in Discipleship in Luke. And so have your Bible ready as we get to hear Jesus' words as he sends his disciples out to make his peace known. As of yesterday, we began meeting back in the YMCA gym for our in-person worship service. It's getting a little too chilly to keep meeting outside most Sundays. And we are going to continue these on Saturdays at 4 p.m. because the Y is completely closed on Sundays right now and we thought we would try Saturdays for the month of October. So if you do come to our indoor service, we are going to follow MDH guidelines and do our part to keep people safe and healthy. We're going to social distance across the gym and face masks are required as we move back indoors. We'll also have a sign in process at the welcome table like you're seeing in restaurants and other places. And so if contact tracing would become necessary that we can easily do that. We are going to provide childcare in the community room for those who are interested. Our kids ministry is going to continue to be a virtual experience and you can watch those at home. They're gonna be posted, the links to the videos on our website and social media by 7 a.m. on Saturdays. Each week, our student ministry for middle and high school will meet in person, primarily outdoors during the month of October. And all students can save the date for our fall party which will be in the Hilliers backyard on October 25th. And we're really looking forward to that time together. A fun fall serving opportunity coming up is Rake the Town on Saturday morning, October 31st. We're gonna be raking leaves to help people in our community and you can sign up for that on our website. If you or someone that you know could use some help with your yard this fall, please let us know that as well. You might have also seen some announcements online about our college care ministry. If you have a college student or are a college student, we would love to have your mailing address so that we can be in touch with you. Prayer is also such a key part of our life together, and we would love to pray specifically for you in any way that we can. So whether it's a praise report or prayer requests, feel free to email prayer at the whychurch.org or call 763-250-9504 for pastoral care. We would really love to hear from you and pray for you. And lastly, giving is also a part of our weekly worship time as we have an opportunity to give a portion of what God has given us back to him. 
So there's a few different ways that you can do that. You can give online at our, our website, thewhychurch.org slash egiving. You can use our mobile giving option by texting YGIVE to 77977. You can also mail your offering in to the address that is there on the screen. We are so thankful for your generosity as we carry out our mission together. And now we invite you to join in as we worship God through song, and then we will hear a story from the Beginner Bible read today by Bennett Tiki.
Another parable about God's love. There was a man who had two sons, said Jesus. He owned a big farm. His youngest son did not want to work anymore. He wanted to travel and have fun, so he asked his father for a share of the family money. The son got the money, he packed his things and left. He couldn't wait to see the world. His family was sad to see him go. At first he had fun spending the money. He bought expensive clothes and he ate fancy food. But soon, all the money was gone. He had to go to work and he got a job with a pig farmer. He was so hungry that even the pig's food looked good. The son wanted to go back home, he said. I will tell my father I am sorry for what I have done. I do not deserve to be called his son. Maybe he will let me work for him. The father saw his son coming down the road. His eyes filled with tears as he ran to greet him. The son said, please forgive me, dad. That night, they had a big party. The father exclaimed, my son was lost, but now he is found. Jesus explained this story. God is like the, this father. He is full of love and joy when people who are lost come back to him. Hi, White Church family. Good to see you. This is Bjorn. Great to have you with us for our online worship service. Hope you've had a great weekend, and uh, here we are, ready to start the new week with our Sunday morning online service. Bennett, thanks for reading for us. Great to have you share our beginner's Bible reading. We want to do our kids' blessing next, and uh, this month we're in Ephesians 4 for that kids' blessing. You're going to see the words on the screen, and then I just invite you to personalize it. You'll see a blank line where you can drop in the name of someone that you want to bless this morning. They might be right across the living room fr uh, from you or on the couch, or they might be many miles away. Um, we started this when we really wanted to speak a blessing over kids, but uh, this blessing can be used for anybody. So feel free to make it your own, and we'll read these words together. Be kind and compassionate to others. May you forgive others, just as in Christ, God forgave you. Amen. Okay, table question time. We are going to use this as a chance just to dialogue a little bit together and get ready for our scripture passage and the message. Our question this morning is, if you're out running errands, where is your favorite place to go? We'd love to have you answer that question. Uh, you can do it with those uh, who you're with this morning as you view the service or um, drop in the responses too into the chat window. We'd love to hear your, your answers. If you're out running errands, What's one of your favorite places to go? And then we're going to hear scripture this morning from Craig Otto.
Today's reading is from Luke 10, 1 through 4, and 17 through 22. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals, and do not greet anyone on the road. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. At that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit, said, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, this is what you were pleased to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows who the Son is except the Father. And no one knows who the Father is except the Son and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal him. I hope you enjoyed that table question. Uh, Craig, thanks too for reading for us from Mark 10. As we settle into this text, I'm thinking about running errands. And I don't know if you like errand running or you would rather skip it. Uh, I should say as an aside, now this year with this pandemic stuff going on, I mean, running errands uh, maybe is looking a little bit different. Maybe you don't run around near as much as you used to. Uh, but in, in general, do you like to run errands? Uh, is that something you enjoy or, or do you not need to do that? It might depend on where you were to go. So for me, if I could choose anywhere to go run an errand, I would pick the hardware store. And I know uh, that makes me definitely all grown up, uh, kind of a boring destination, but not for me. You know, I, and I remember being a kid and watching my dad open like a Christmas gift or birthday gift, and it would be a tool. And I would think to myself, oh, that poor guy, he got another tool. I didn't understand it back then, but I certainly do now. And it doesn't matter to me if it's Home Depot or Menards, or uh, we live up in Zimmerman's. So there's this little hardware Hank store, family run business. I, I could go to any of those places and just wander around, find all kinds of stuff to look at tools, light bulbs, uh, outdoor equipment, building supplies. Uh, I can run that kind of errand all day long, no problem. Uh, maybe followed by an ice cream cone uh, now that I think about it. So that would be my perfect outing. Uh, today we get to look at an errand of sorts in Luke 10, an errand that Jesus sends us on that is far more meaningful than any other place that we could go. In fact, errand probably isn't the right word, is it? It really is about mission, this breathtaking, dangerous, lifelong mission uh, that Jesus has for us. And he has some instructions for his disciples that he wants to give, both as they go and as they return. And it's these instructions from Jesus that we want to see today, because this is our mission too. So let's look at Luke 10 and see what there is to see here. You'll notice uh, that we read a few verses at the beginning and then at the end of the passage. And what I really want to encourage you to do, maybe later today, is to fill in all those verses that, for time reasons, we, we skipped over. So we did the first four verses, then we skipped a bunch, and then picked it up at the end. But, but Luke, 1, or Luke 10, verses 1 through 24, is a whole section about mission. And we just kind of did those bookends together. But the scene is set for us in the opening verse where it says that Jesus appoints and sends 72 others. Now, the reason it says others is because this is building on what's already happened. In chapter 9, Jesus had sent the 12 disciples. And now here's 72 more, 72 others. 
Um, we know that Jesus did not just have these 12 disciples uh, following him around, but there was a whole company of people, of men and women, who were followers of Jesus. And now he adds to that first number of 12, another 72. Now, some of your Bibles may say 70 instead of 72. It's about a 50-50 split. The reason for that is that in the early manuscripts, uh, which were the physical copies of the original, in that process, you know, they didn't have a copy machine in the back office room or a home printer, but um, they would copy it by hand. And in that process, a scribe misread this number. Maybe the candlelight was running low or it was smudged. Um, and so this error got in there very early on in those manuscripts and those copies. And then it just got passed on. And so we really can't quite tell if the original was 72 or 70. But the, the point remains the same, regardless of the exact number. This is about six times as many as the 12 who were sent out a chapter earlier. And he sends out these 72 others in pairs to prepare people in the towns up ahead to meet Jesus. Now, this is an important corrective, I think, to how we sometimes caricature discipleship. You know, following Jesus does not mean that we just stay at Jesus' feet the whole time. Uh, when my wife Esther is making uh, supper in the evening, and she's in the kitchen. So usually at this phase of our life, she does the cooking and I do the dishes along with the kids. That's been our pattern. And when she is working in the kitchen, inevitably the dog just follows her around, like is right on her heels in the kitchen. She steps three feet, three feet one direction. He steps three feet that direction. She goes to the fridge door. He goes to the fridge door. He's just this little shadow down there. But that is not the total picture of discipleship. It's not just about staying at Jesus' feet, but it's also about being sent by him on mission. One theologian put it this way. He said, he calls us to him in order that we might go for him, in order that we might introduce others to him. And that was pictured for us this weekend as we celebrated a, a baptism. Liam Otto was baptized. And so as we, we had baptism together, I'm just thinking, yeah, Liam is called to God to go for God and to share the good news about God. And I can't wait to see that little guy grow up. And, uh, you know, maybe he'll hit home runs and softball like his dad does, or maybe he'll ride horses with his mom. But all those things aside, what I'm really excited about is to see this little boy in his calling and his commissioning being lived out in his life. Liam is sent by Jesus on mission. And, and now here's Jesus' first bit of instruction to us. He says in verse 2, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Now, the fall is harvest time, and we're in it in Minnesota, and so, uh, and, and have been now for, for a little while. So, corn fields, soybeans, apple orchards, pumpkin patches, this is harvest time. And when the harvest is ready, uh, you've got to get out there. There's this window of time where you get to bring in the harvest. In Jesus' day, as in ours, uh, they would hire, in, in many places, extra workers to come and work the harvest fields uh, because there was so much work to get done in a short amount of time. Depending on the crop, you maybe had a few weeks or even just a few days to bring in the harvest. And here Jesus is sending out another 72, and yet he still says the workers are few. Did you know that there are over 7 billion people in the world? Uh, of which about 2 billion have never had the gospel shared with them. That means one in four people on the planet have never heard that God loves them so much that he sent his one and only son to die for them and their sins on the cross so they could have everlasting life. They've never heard that message. And on a more local level, uh, of course, we, we have friends and coworkers, classmates, neighbors, even relatives, where 
they don't yet know God's love for them in Christ. The harvest is plentiful. Jesus said it 2,000 years ago, and it's still true today. We need more workers in the field. Now, when I say that, uh, I do not mean church workers and pastors, though certainly in our church family, we hope that, that those workers are raised up as well. But, but it means followers of Jesus. When you think about the original disciples, I mean, you had fishermen, a tax guy. Jesus is calling us, whoever we are, to follow him. People then who are ready to live their lives on mission and share the good news of his salvation. Jesus says we should ask the Lord of the harvest uh, for workers to send out into the field. And when he gives an imperative like that, he says it so directly. That's exactly what we want to do. You know, we can strategize and, and plan and preach, but Jesus says, pray. That's where this begins. That's where the tide changes when we just ask God to do it. Still in that same word of instruction, Jesus continues in verse 3 by saying, Go, I am sending you out as lambs among wolves. I don't know about you, but, you know, I kind of like the pumpkin patch picture. I don't know about this one. I don't know about this lambs among wolves thing. But, but let's start first with the imperative. Jesus says, go, exclamation point. Uh, we should pay particular attention to the commands of Jesus. And he just gets right to the point. One word, go. Our varsity uh, football players uh, across so, so many parts of the state, they got to play their first football game uh, just this weekend on Friday night. And these players, they have been waiting to play. You know, at first this, the whole season was canceled. And then, uh, you know, they revisited that question and decided, all right, there is going to be a, a season. And so on Friday night, for the first time, after all this waiting, I just imagine uh, a coach then with, with his team huddled around him it's the pregame pep talk, and then it's finally time, and the, and the coach releases his players, and they burst onto the field full of energy, ready to play. They've been waiting for this, and so it is as Jesus sends out the 72. This is their time, but then look at this sobering word right after he says, go. He says, I'm sending you out as lambs among wolves. Pumpkin patches sound good. Uh, Friday night football games sound good, but not this. W what is this? Lambs being sent out among wolves. Wolves eat lambs. These are not lambs that are going to a 4 H contest or to a state fair contest. These are lambs being sent right into danger. The mission Jesus sends us on is dangerous. And we know that lambs are inherently weak. Lambs cannot boast of their strength or their ferocity or their speed. But nonetheless, Jesus sends out lambs. If you know your Bible, then you know that this is the way that God likes to work. With lambs in a wolf's world. Just think of the stories. Uh, the call of Moses. He says, uh, Moses says back to God, God, why would you pick me? I can't put two sentences together. God, I, I'm not a public speaker. To which God says, Moses, don't be afraid. I will be with you. Think of the call of Gideon. God calls Gideon and Gideon says, God, I'm from the weakest clan in my whole tribe. In fact, I'm, I'm the smallest kid in my whole family. And God says to Gideon, Gideon, don't be afraid. I will be with you. And then later in the story, if you remember, God puts Gideon at the head of Israel's army. And he says to him, Gideon, you know, while you're at it here, I'm going to have you trim this army down from 32,000 men to just 300. We, we won't need all these soldiers. Just 300 will do. That's the way God likes to work. And, and one last example, I think of the call of Jeremiah. What's his excuse? Jeremiah says, Lord, I'm too young. I'm too inexperienced. I, I can't do this. To which God says, do not be afraid. I will be with you. My brothers and sisters, God has appointed you and chosen you and sent you 
in spite of you. He doesn't need exceptional people because he is an exceptional God. He is looking for lambs who are willing to go and who will trust in the shepherd's strength. Chances are like Moses, Gideon, or Jeremiah, and there's so many other biblical examples, uh, you maybe often get hung up on your weaknesses, on what you can't do right or can't do well, or uh, on your limitations. You know, you might think to yourself, God, why would you choose me? I'm, I'm not at the head of my class. I didn't make the A team in sports. I'm not a public speaker. I'm not the smartest one at my job or leading my field. I'm not from an important place or an important family. I'm not very good at a whole bunch of things. God, why would you choose me? And God says, it's okay. My grace will be sufficient for you. For my power is perfected in weakness. Words he says to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians. So off they go, these 72 lambs. But not before Jesus gives them one final word of instruction about how they are to travel. Look at verse 4 with me. Jesus says, do not take a purse or a bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. In other words, he's saying travel light and travel quick. In the Greek text, the word that's used for purse is uh, whatever they would use to carry their money in. So you might think of your wallet or billfold or a purse, you know, the, the money bag. And then the word that's translated as bag was a technical term in Greek that signaled this is the traditional traveler's bag. So you might think of like a fancy backpack, a knapsack or something like that. And this traveler's backpack was symbolic of independence. All right, it's what someone took in their culture on a trip uh, across the open country. It's where they kept all their supplies. It meant I am self-sufficient. I'm independent. I'm a traveling man. And Jesus says, what does he say? Don't take a purse and don't take that bag. And these restrictions are meant to show our dependence on God. In fact, Jesus tags this on, doesn't he? He says, don't even take an extra pair of sandals. Now, that might not be our common footwear, but, um, but they wore sandals was, was the classic footwear that they would have for traveling. And I wonder when you travel, how many pairs of shoes do you bring? You know, I, I mean, I, th I think even for myself, I might think I'm a light traveler, but then you think, okay, if I'm away for a few days, you have someplace warm, you've got your sandals for the beach. Uh, if you're going to go hiking, you, you got your hiking boots. Uh, maybe you have your tennis shoes for walking around, or maybe you're going to get a workout in. I mean, we tend to carry around quite a few shoes with us. And here we are, Jesus is speaking about sandals because that's what they would bring. And they would always have a backup pair. You know, the lack sandals in their culture to be barefoot was to be identified with the poor. And in an honor shame culture, you didn't want to be identified with the poor. So they always brought a backup pair. You know, if you're on your way to Jerusalem and you bust the sandal, then you, you've got your backups. And Jesus says, leave them behind. Leave them behind. It is just one more thing for you to carry. And I wonder, I'm asking myself in Luke 10, and I'm asking you this morning, uh, why do we carry around so much extra stuff in our life? You ever realize how much we accumulate and store and carry around? I mean, we have garages, but they're not just for cars, they're also for stuff. And when our garages get full, then we, we build a shed. And when the shed gets full, then we build a bigger shed. And when that shed is full, then we maybe have to rent a storage unit. And all this stuff that we have and accumulate, it requires time and attention and maintenance. I bet you have a file at home that has all the manuals of the stuff that you have to take care of, from your mechanical toothbrush to the HVAC filter, from your air exchanger to the dishwasher, from your car to your lawnmower, from uh, your phone to your computer, from checking your smoke detectors to making sure your snowblower is ready in a few weeks. Change this, check that, tune this, fix that, winterize this. The list is overwhelming. We carry around so much stuff in our life that I find it, it can be near impossible to go anywhere. 
I have a friend in the global YMCA whose name is Oscar. Oscar Ordinez is the CEO of the YMCA of Chile. And I have been a few places with Oscar over the years. And whenever Oscar shows up, he steps off the plane and he is wearing the clothes on his back and he has this little brown briefcase that he carries. I mean, he might be on a 10 day trip on the other side of the world and that is how Oscar shows up. He travels light. Whatever you're carrying in your life, you know this and I am here to remind you, you can't take it with you. And Jesus wants to send you places. He says to his disciples, don't even greet anyone on the road. And he's not saying be rude. He's saying, don't get distracted. But this message is so urgent. This mission is so dangerous. You want to travel quick and travel light. On your own, I want you to remember to fill in verses 5 to 16. Uh, we're just doing the bookends here, and we're going to jump to verse 17. And we're picking it up now. So after the 72 have gone out, they come back. And they give this report. And our closing minutes will be spent in these verses. Verse 17. The 72 returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. So the 72 are back and they are pumped because they have been on this mission trip. And they literally have seen how evil demonic forces are cast out from people as they speak a word. And, you know, exorcism is the technical term for this. And it tends to be portrayed in movies um, in a certain kind of weird way with a Hollywood vibe around it, probably for a lot of us. But this is, this is real stuff. And the 72 are amazed that they have this kind of authority over the spiritual realm. Is it exciting? Yes, absolutely. Jesus doesn't deny that. But he sees they're rejoicing ultimately in the wrong thing. They're rejoicing in their spiritual power. And Jesus says, no, rejoice in your spiritual home. He says, I saw Satan fall like lightning. So, so yes, spiritually, his defeat is happening. And then these references to um, snakes and scorpions is symbolic of Satan's demonic force, forces. And, and Jesus says, you have authority from me over demons who oppress people. And they have no power to do you harm. However, verse 20, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. I've got a Bible trivia pop quiz for you. All right, here it is. What were the names of the 72? It's kind of a trick question because we don't know. Nobody knows but God. Their names are not written anywhere in the Bible, but they are written in the book of life. And that is what really matters. Do you know what really matters in your life? That you are personally known by God and your place with him for all eternity is secure. You don't need to be famous down here. You don't need to make a name for yourself. You don't need to be well known, but just to have your name written in the book of life. That is worth rejoicing. Jesus himself seems to, to rejoice so much at this that look what happens in verse 21. He says, or the text says, at that time, Jesus, full of joy through the Holy Spirit said, it's like spontaneously, he just is brought to prayer. He says, I praise you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because you've hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. What Jesus is teaching and revealing about God, you would expect the religious experts to get first dibs on it. I mean, why would the most precious truths about God be revealed to people like us? It's what we saw earlier. There we were lambs. Now we're called little children, but the idea is the same. God tips the usual scales upside down, and he makes himself known to the smallest not the strongest, to those who will seek him like children, not to the self-sufficient, self-made, self-governed grown-ups. Then the closing line of our passage, 
Jesus pulls aside his disciples and he has this word just for them. So he, he pulls aside the 12 in this moment and he says, and you can almost hear him with a hushed tone leaning in, they're huddled around and he says, blessed are the eyes that see what you see. He goes on to say prophets and kings of old didn't get to see it, but you get to see it. Are you seeing it today? I'm asking that question of you. Are you seeing the mission that God has sent you on? And I don't care what age you are or stage in life. You are appointed and sent by God on a mission. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. The fields are ready. The wolves are waiting. And the great shepherd of the sheep is sending you out. So may you go in his strength, with his message, and with his joy. Because your name is written in the book of life. Let's pray together. Lord, out of joyful, obedient hearts, we want to follow your commands. So Lord, would you help us to go where you will send us? Would you teach us to travel light and to let go and get rid of anything that would hinder us? And Lord, would others come to know you through our bold and faithful witness? Would you give us eyes to see these things? We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to sing one more worship song, and then I'll be back to finish our time together.
Well, we're going to turn to prayer now and join our voices. Wherever you are watching this, we want you to know that you are vitally connected to a family of believers. Uh, the Y Church, the church in our city, in our region and state, the global church. And so we unite our voices from living rooms and uh, computers at work and wherever it is that you're able to pull this up and listen to this message in this worship service. We, are, we unite our voices in these words. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. So great to worship with you. Thanks for joining us. A couple things before we share our closing blessing. Remember that uh, this Sunday 930 online service will always be available for you. Uh, but we're also back at the Y, in the Y now for worship. Uh, in fact, this uh, this is where I'm at. I'm, I'm in my little office here at the YMCA. And on Saturdays at four o'clock in the month of October, we're only planning a month at a time, uh, you can come to the Y uh, for worship. We do wear masks. Everything is socially distanced. Uh, but it has just been a great weekend of being able to move back into the Y, uh, our mission field, our mission partner, and our church home. So with that, uh, blessings as you start into this new week, and I want to share these words of blessing with you as we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor, and may he give you his peace. Amen. Have a great week, everybody. We'll catch you again next time.